So I'm going to call, it's becoming tuned with your heart. You know, so often um, in my, my journey with the Lord um, as I'm reading, and I know some of this I maybe even shared before with you personally or kind of been in between sermons because for me it's been such a, um, a key to the journey that's been in my life where God just keeps coming back to me and, and pointing something out in my life. And I believe part of that is just being tuned. You know what, what um, I'm going to, I'm going to start by reading a verse. How's that sound? Luke 6, 44 through 45. It says, a tree is identified by its fruit. Say it's fruit. We get that, right? Apple trees as apples. We got all that. So figs are never gathered from thorn bushes and grapes are not picked from bramble bushes. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What's, what you say flows from what is in your heart. Um, again, to me, becoming tuned with your heart. When I think of tuned, for me, I know I'm a motorhead at some levels, maybe not as much as I could be, um, but I, I think of motor. I think of tuning a motor. Uh, you know, for me, my dad, uh, when I was growing up, he had Jeeps, and we were always going out four by in and trying to climb bigger hills than the guy next to us and break stuff, and I loved it. I thought it was the awesomest thing growing up. We went up and just went shooting. But in the midst of that, because he was passionate about it, I went out and saw drag races and mud bogs, and it was just it's what we did growing up. And, you know, there's times, even my boys and my daughters, there's times that I'm passionate about something, and some of my kids are passionate about it. Other times, they're not so passionate about it. That's okay, right? We're all a little bit different. But for me, the vehicle thing, just, I loved it. I loved everything about them. And because of that, I got, early on, I got into the, um, into the auto body business and started working on cars and building motorcycles. And it was just something that, it, it was in me. And I feel like so often um, in my life, that just the whole motor thing and the intricate of a motor um, is what, because of how my brain works, I th sometimes the Lord uses that to teach me stuff, right? I think we do that in every profession that you're in. It doesn't matter if it, what it is. Sometimes God uses that to bring other stuff out of our lives. And I believe that, um, again, just growing up around cars, my dad was teaching me how to hear different sounds to either need more fuel or less fuel, and that, that's changed drastically as our technology's changed, but even still, uh, if people are very familiar with something, whatever they're working on, whatever they're into, sometimes they can, especially when it comes to equipment, they can just hear something a little bit different and think something's wrong with that, and know either, I mean, with it just being in the yard, people are working on stuff, they'll know, oh, that's going to happen, and they'll go over, shut something off, say, we need to fix this before it even happens because of their experience in tuning it. It just happens, and so, and I, I know that for me, I feel like thinking, tuning my heart, I think so often God is wanting us to be tuned with our heart in the same way that we are with so many other things in our life. I think a lot of times our professions, we invest everything into, and oftentimes our hearts we invest little into. And I'm, I'm going to read a couple of scriptures because it's amazing how important our heart is to the Lord and why God keeps coming back to that in my life. Psalms 139.1 says, O Lord, you've examined my heart and know everything about me. Proverbs 21.2 says, People may be right in their own eyes, but the Lord examines their heart. Everybody say heart. There's so many scriptures that talk about the heart. Um, if we jump in here in 1 Samuel 16, Saul was rejected and Samuel was headed down with a flask of oil to anoint David. It's amazing to me that the main reason Saul was rejected is because of prideness, because there was pride in his heart. It started with his heart. It usually starts in our heart something small and grows to something big. We all know that. Yet at the same time, I think so often we, we have a tendency not to pay attention to it. But this here is 1 Samuel 16, 7. It says, but the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance. Again, we know this, but Samuel comes and he goes to anoint David. Uh, Jesse, the dad, brings his boys out. David, who he's supposed to anoint, is not in the room. But the first older son that, that Samuel sees, he instantly says this. He says, this is God says, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. Lo the Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You know, I think so often because of our culture saying that we have to be a certain way, look a certain way. I know we all know that, and I know that we are all affected by it. Who would agree with that? We are all affected by it. You know, uh, because me and my wife were in youth ministry for as many years as we were, 
uh, we saw a lot of patterns in some of the some of the young daughters, some of the sons. We just saw patterns, and so as we, our kids were being raised, and this may seem a, little, seem a little extreme to you guys, but like I didn't have like workout magazines, or I wouldn't let. If, if one day I came home and there was a magazine that was like a swimsuit model on it, not that I thought, oh my gosh, that's terrible, but I was like, why is this in our house? Because I didn't want my daughters to think that that had anything to do with their identity. And so because of what I saw, so many young ladies just through their whole life is trying to, just struggling with identity and what that looks like, we, I, we were pretty strict on it. And we tried really hard to be careful with even makeup. And I know for us, we saw makeup was making our daughters want to get older quick and making boys look at them closer, all the stuff. And we just said, you know what? Uh, we're going to hold off, and we're just going to wait and allow them to feel beautiful for who they are, not for what they put on. And I'll tell you what, in this culture, in this day, that is a difficult thing to do. It takes time. It takes energy. And I'm not saying that, you know, workout magazines are bad. I'm not saying any, I'm not saying makeup's bad. I'm just saying we have a tendency to be very outward. We do as a culture. We do as people. And because we often are taught how to think by our culture, we put that into our spirit, man. We just do. Like often, however we're trained in the natural, whatever's going on in the natural, sometimes we'll take that same thing and we'll plug it into uh, how we're taught, we'll be plugged into, and it will drastically affect our spirit. Mark 7, 14 through 15 says, Then Jesus called to the crowd to come and hear. All of you listen, he said, and try to understand. It is not what goes into your body that defiles you. You are defiled by what comes from your heart. Deuteronomy 6, 5 says, And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. There is so many, I mean, there's literally so many verses about our heart. But here it is. It just, Mark 7, 20 through 20 says this. And then he added, It is what comes from inside that defiles you. For from within... Out of a person's heart comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. You know, it's pretty amazing to me, you guys, how much stuff is just coming from inside of our heart. And yet I think so often how we have a tendency to ignore it. Uh, we ignore the signs at any level, and because our culture is so focused on outward and what's happening in our life and what our life looks like, that we're able to just kind of bag it. I think often what's in our heart is between uh, us and God. He knows it. He knows all the details of our heart, and because um, we may not be at a place of feeling condemned by it or uncertain about it, because we know no one else is in the room knows, it becomes acceptable. It becomes okay. It's not okay. But it becomes a thing. And I think it's one of the reasons for me, God is just keeps pinpointing my heart. Like, what is going on in there? Do you hear anything? Is there anything happening? Constantly coming back to my heart. You know, again, just with tuning cars and just my life, I just became intrigued with the internal combustion motor. It, it, it blew my mind that an itty-bitty little spark could explode and make tires smoke tires. I loved it, and I didn't. It, it blew my mind. How can a car have gas and fuel in this perfect little chamber explode, push down, and cause a vehicle to go forward? You know, uh, I know the technology changed some, but an eight-cylinder motor has an explosion, a little fire, like 66 times a second. What's more amazing to me is that we just get in a car. We got cars in our parking lot, right? We just get in, start it up, and we just come to church or go wherever, right? You're not thinking about little bitty explosions or large explosions or how it works or anything, right? We just get in the car and we go places. And yet, it doesn't take away from it being a really a phenomenal piece of machinery. It's rare that we even pay attention to it unless something feels wrong or there's a check engine light that comes on. And everyone responds differently to check engine lights. <laughs> right, Cheryl? Some people, it's like, I don't, do you smell anything? I don't smell anything. No, I don't smell anything. Does it feel weird? No, we're good. We're good. We're good. We'll get that later. <laughs> Cheryl's like, that is not me. I'm not saying that's you, Cheryl. I just, it's your birthday. Her car has over 300,000 miles on it. 335,000 miles. It's almost as old as what? Oh, just kidding. Here, let's. <laughs> 
I'm going to ease up. I could go all night. I'm not going to start that. I'm sorry, Cheryl. I love you. I always say if I tease you, I love you. You know that. But what happens is other people, a check engine light comes on, and they are pulling the car over, calling tow trucks. They're not even moving the thing. I don't know what's wrong. There's a light that's on. I'm not driving it. It's going to burn to the ground with me in it. Right? Like we respond totally different. And yet the amazing thing to me is we, we take it in, we have it tested, we put a test light on it, and, and we try to figure out what the problem is. And if we ignore it, it can cost a huge amount of money. It's fixable a lot of times, but it can devastate a vehicle. You know, being, again, for years I was in the auto body business, and vehicles were pretty much, for most people, the second biggest payment of their life. They usually had a house or a rental and a vehicle. So people cared a ton about cars, way too much. But at the same time, I get it. We have to get to work. We have to use them. And so when a check engine light comes on, a lot of times we think, oh, my gosh, this is, it cost me money. I don't want anything to break. And we begin to figure out how to fix this before something de detrimental happens. And we test it. And I, I do the same thing with our heart. God tests our heart, and he does it at times so that we can know there's a light on so that we can come to a place of realizing that God cares so much about our heart, how, how much are we caring about what's coming out of it? Proverbs 17.3 says, Fire tests the purity of silver and gold, but the Lord tests the heart. Hmm. Jeremiah 17.8 through 10. I'm going to just jump down to, the, to number 9 here. It says, The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. Ooh, I must say that again. And examines secret motives. I give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. <sighs> you know, in 1 Samuel uh, 15, it's Saul. I'm going to go there. First Samuel. 15, 20. Saul said, but I did obey the Lord. I went where the Lord sent me. I destroyed all the Amalekites. I brought back only one, their king Agag. And the soldiers took the best sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God. At Gilgad, but Sammy answered, "Which is pleases which pleases the Lord more, burnt offerings and sacrifice, or obeying His commands? It is better to obey the Lord than to offer sacrifices to Him. It is better to listen to Him than to offer the fat from ram. Refusing to obey is as bad as the sin of sorcery. Being stubborn and doing what you want is like the sin of worshiping idols." You refuse to obey the Lord's command, so he now refuses to accept you as king. The reason that Saul lost his kingship is because pride entered into his heart. And God finally gave him a test, and he failed. That scares me. It scares me even more knowing that if... If it doesn't matter at the end of the day what you guys think about me, it doesn't matter that all that really matters is where I'm at with the Lord, that should begin to really stir us for being the same thing, not caring so much about what others think or what we're putting off and beginning to say, okay, God, I don't care about that. What is in my heart that you need to, that you need to burn off? What is in my heart that needs to come out so that I can have a pure heart? This is a story about Hezekiah, uh, 2 Chronicles 32. Hezekiah was a very, very blessed man. If you go back just a few verses, it's talking about him having to build huge barns for his gold and his silver and his cattle, right? God has, was just tremendously blessing him, which is what we always ask for, right? So God bless us and, and uh, make us prosper and help us push forward. And Well, this is amazing to me. It says, this is Hezek about Hezekiah. It says, He blocked up the upper spring of Gihon and brought the water down through a tunnel to the west side of the city of David. And so he's, he succeeded in everything he did. That's pretty amazing. How many people would like to have that on there? It says again, And he succeeded in everything he did. It was obvious God was blessing him. 
However, when the ambassadors arrived from Babylon to ask about the remarkable events that had taken place in the land, God withdrew from Hezekiah in order to test him and to see what was really in his heart. So here is a man who's being supernaturally blessed by God. He moves, this is way back in the day, he moves the water, right? He blocks something up, builds a canal, and moves water to another side. And people are coming over to be like, this is amazing. Wow, how did you do this? What did you do? Hey, come check out my gold. You think that's a big deal? Look what I got. And it says that the Lord withdrew from him to see if he would say, yeah, this is, I'm, I'm the man. I built this. This is awesome. I've got tons of wisdom. To us, we read the words sometimes. We think, okay, that makes sense to me. But, but what's, God is testing our hearts, guys. In our own journeys in life with what he's given us or what we feel or how we're having an attitude or what we're prospering or not prospering in, God is testing our hearts. And the truth is, at the end of the day, that is all that matters. Is, is where are we in our hearts? We talk about loving people, and that is 100%. We need to learn how to love. But we learn how to love out of a purity in our heart, out of submitting to God, pushing pride away, pushing our own stuff away, our own grumpiness and our own, I want this for me. The, the more that goes away, the purer our heart is, the easier it is to love others. And as God's saying, learn how to love. He's saying, what is in your heart that's not supposed to be there? You know, the thing to me is we do a lot of deliverance prayer. We actually just took a team up to, um, Dave uh, did a DTS training up at the YWAM base in Chico, and we took a, a team of four of us went up there and on Friday morning and just prayed for everybody. Anybody wanted prayer up there, we, we spent an hour with them and prayed for them. It was awesome. It was a great time. We had deliverance prayer. And we do it all over the world. We travel and pray for people. One of the things I did notice is that, we pray for people all the time. I think as, as a lot of times if you're a Christian and you hear somebody sick, you, you pray for them, you pray at night, you pray in the morning, I mean, we pray. But it's very rare for us to get personal prayer for more than just a few minutes. Like usually somebody might pray for you or you're feeling sick or somebody might lay hands on you and pray for you. But we love ministry time. There's something about it. I'm not saying we. I think just our spirit. There's something about getting personal time where people pray over you, speak into you, that is life-changing. And we were just coming down the hill, and I was just like, you know what's amazing is some of these people that we're praying for, for, for deliverance purpose, but some of them have never been prayed over really, right? They've never really even had somebody just, just stand down and say, how you doing? What can I pray for? And start praying. They haven't had it. And that in itself brings massive change to people. And we were just talking on the way home, like, we, we need to do that more. Just in our own lives, we're like, how can we do that just for staff, right? Like, we're all here. Let's just stop and say, okay, it's your turn today. Let's spend a few minutes. Let's just pray for you and see what God does, and bless, right? And I say that because, remember, that we know it's important, and we know it's a big deal, and we can do it for each other. We have people all the time say, no one's ever prayed for me. No one's ever really prayed for me. And that's, that's all of our jobs. It's super easy. We get distracted. We get busy. And I just want to encourage all of us in that. If, if you're going through life's new spirit, we need to be able to speak into people's lives, just pray for them, encourage them. And that brings so much more fruit than we could ever imagine. And we were just realizing that on the way back down the hill. Like, we need to figure out how to be able to just kind of pour into people as individuals more. Does that make sense? I know we're busy. We have a lot going on. But there's a, there's a huge amount of fruit that just comes out of not even necessarily deliverance prayer, just us praying for each other. And so we should all be able to do that. It's just a matter of making time. If somebody asks, let's, all the time when somebody says, hey, could you pray for me for that? I say, yes, let's pray. Usually it's like, yeah, I'll pray for that. And we like walk off, right? I'm always like, let's pray for that right now on the phone. Let's pray for that right now. And I want to I begin to taking more time to be to be strategic in slowing down and praying for people. I think it's healthy for all of us. I know it's healthy in my life, but it's amazing how much we can affect each other as Christians in just doing something as simple as that. If somebody says, hey, my so-and-so sick, can you pray for him? Just stop. Say, let's do that right now. Let's just pray for him right now. Let's not just say, oh, yeah, okay, and just put it, check a box. Let's slow down and begin to pray for people because it's, it's a big deal. Deuteronomy 13.3 says, do not listen to them. This is another one where God is, is just 
pulling away from it. says, the Lord God is testing you to see if you truly love him with all your heart and soul. Hmm. You know, uh, because of how much I, early on, just I rode dirt bikes from the time I was, I was pretty young and then started riding sport bikes. And then it had, on, for me, it was awesome. I got to do some track days on the track and, and ride with some guys that were really good riders. And they kind of taught me. And I, I loved it. It was, I was really, really, I would, the first time I did it, I came back trying to figure out how I could, like, sell a kid <laughs> to be able to do it for a living. <laughs> my kids aren't in here, so I can, oh, maybe one of those. I was like, this was the funnest thing I've ever done in my life. This is what I was created for, racing motorcycles. It has to be it, God. You put it in my heart, desire, I'm doing it. And it was one of those things in me that I started realizing we can become very, very, almost with machinery, almost like it's part of us. I know I mentioned chainsaws. I know that uh, a lot of guys run chainsaws. We do different things. And we can become so tuned to a piece of equipment. Um, you know, we're, I was walking out here. It was a work day. That it was about to end. And there was one guy up on the roof nailing off the roof, right? And it was pop, 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 pop. It was fast. And I got super nervous. This sounds ridiculous. I heard him going, and somebody said, oh, man, he must be really good. I said, no, that doesn't mean he's really good. That just means he's really fast. <laughs> he could be ruining a whole lot of stuff up there right now. He could be quickly doing it wrong, right? So I wasn't thinking, oh, my gosh, this guy's awesome. I was thinking, who is on there? Stop him. And I walk out, and it's got a roofing truck with a roofing thing on it. Do you know who was up there? He's a roofing company. He just came out for hours till the sunset. He just blessed us. He heard what was going on and came out, and I, I saw that tr roofing truck, and I was like, oh, hallelujah. He knows what he's doing. He was getting it done. But it sounds ridiculous, but I'll guarantee you as he's going, he knows just before a nail comes out, he knows when the pressure is low. There's things that people, we use something so much that we can begin to just notice when it's, it's slightly off. And I want to ask us, are we doing that? Are we listening to our hearts? And here's what I mean by that. Are we beginning to really say, man, was that pride? Why did I just respond that way? Like, what was that? Man, I, I hear so many people make excuses about why it was okay that they responded some way. We always know our flesh, it's okay to respond negatively. We, it's, there's all kinds of reasons why it's okay to be mad at somebody. There's, there's tons of them. We could line up and start talking about them. Who wants to start? Cheryl? <laughs> she said it's not okay. I, I've, through the years, heard people say I'm Irish, so I have this, or I was raised by, I lived on a, you don't understand. But the truth is, if we're serious about serving the Lord and loving people, we should be even more serious about what is going on in our hearts. Because here's the deal, guys. You can cover it up for us. But God knows all that's going on in here. And if we will be willing to truly slow down and listen to it, become so tuned with our heart and care about it so much that when, when something's out of order, instead of just thinking, do you smell anything? I don't smell nothing. How are, we, are we good? I think we're good. No shaking? Pin it. We'll make it to the destination probably. Instead of doing that, like, pull over, stop the car, shut it down, lights on, something's wrong, I don't care if it's small or big, let's fix it before we have a train wreck. Guys, we, we don't. I believe that. I believe stuff comes up, and we just don't have time, we bag it, we push up, something happens, and we just think, you know what, I'll get to that later. There's a, there's a lot of reasons why, but if we will slow down, like, really slow down, we're going to say, okay, God. What is in here that is not of you? If we will test it before we're tested, there's a good chance we'll pass the test. And, and, and to me, it's been, it's been a major deal in my life because God is just constantly poking at it, and I'm, I'm wanting to hear it. And that doesn't mean, I mean, the Bible says it's, we don't even know what all's in the heart. Like, it is wicked. It's one of the hardest things because even if we... For example, we do deliverance and somebody's set free of, of some sort of lust. 
Somebody set free, lost to have no more demonic bondages. Often they come out like, I feel different. The next week they're like, man, this is amazing. We have testimonies about, man, I, I don't feel the same way. I'm not thinking the same way. It's awesome. But what happens is there, there may not be a demonic siege that's causing us just being bombarded by the same thing. But our flesh, we still have to submit it. So often with certain sins, they're, they're lust sins, they're things that feel good. Often we're not just in fight against the demonic, we're fight against our own flesh. And it's a battle we have to push for, whether there's demonic or not. The demonic is going to upset it more, make it way, way harder. But you get that broke off, we still have to submit this thing. You know, for me, I've, I've majorly struggled, and I know I've shared this a lot, I've struggled with my weight. But not just weight, I've struggled with my eating habits. That's the best way to say it. For years, I was begging God, God, I want to be disciplined in my eating habits. That was my goal. I want to be disciplined. And I used to always, uh, hmm. I realized, again, God showed inside my heart. There was a time I was saying, I want to be disciplined in my eating habits. But the truth was, I really didn't. If I could eat terrible and look great, I would have just kept eating terrible. (laughs) If I could have abs and have cake every night, oh yeah, that sounds like a good day. That's my youngest son, by the way. Abs, cake every night. Not really. (laughs) But I learned that because I was telling everybody... I, I want to I, I become disciplined in eating habits, but I was out on a run. This is the last time I tried to lose weight, not this time. I was out on a run, and, uh, and God, I was just running, and I'm psychopath, so I'm yelling at myself, die, flesh, die. I'm literally exhausted. My body's hurting, and I'm just pushing, die. I'm killing my flesh right now. Yeah. And the Lord says, quit lying to people. I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, you keep telling everybody that you don't care what you look like. You just want to become disciplined in your eating habits. But what if I let you right now with how much you're working for it, stay where you're at? I thought, oh, I'd be really mad. <laughs> and he said, quit lying about it. If, if you're wanting change because you're wanting to, if you want to drop weight because you want to look better, tell people I'm just trying to lose some weight. If you want to become disciplined in your habits, then, then push towards that. Right? He just pointed out something in my heart that it sounds ridiculous. I didn't even notice was there. I think if I'd been honest with myself, I might have noticed it was there, but I was just like, lights on, I'm good. <laughs> you know, this time, again, I, I came to a place after that. I started doing, I, I've, been, I've been on a roller coaster ride. I, I was just came off about three months ago. I was 292 pounds. And the truth is, I'm still very, very active, and I would have been much, much larger if I, if I, because I was just, I'm active. I still do a lot of stuff, and I've done a lot better with my eating habits. I don't sit down and eat a bowl of, I mean, I don't sit down and eat like a whole entire one-gallon jug of ice cream. I don't, but I'll have a couple bowls. Like, it's not as bad. At Thanksgiving, if there's five pies, you got to try a little bit of all five. Like, I'm normal, but, but here, what happened to me is I just, I had a spirit of gluttony for me. I wasn't just kind of like struggling with it. Every single meal, if we went out somewhere, I knew I shouldn't be ordering what I was ordering. I ordered it anyways. I would sneak home. On the way home from church, I'd swing into Carl's Jr. and get a burger and eat it in the parking lot. <laughs> and then go home and like throw the trash away, hoping the car didn't smell like it in the morning. <laughs> just walk in. No, I'm good. You want anything? No, I'm good. I'm going to bed. And then my wife would be like, did you go to Carl's Jr.? She'd see it on the books. Oh, I should have used cash. <laughs> Guys, it, for years, it, when I was younger, I ate whatever I wanted, and I didn't realize I had an issue because I just I, I wasn't gaining any weight. I just was doing life. But it's been something I've been literally begging God. God, change my heart. I want to be disciplined in my eating habits. There's been several times I've gone two, three months I'm not going to do any sugar, no bread, no cheese. I'm there right now. I'm on another three months. I, I'm going, again, it's a, I'm trying to do a fasting slash killing the flesh. Because I want to break that off of my life. I don't want it to dominate my life. And our culture is acceptable with me eating whatever I want. 
So there's no one holding me accountable but me. Right? If I go to somebody's house, they offer me something, I take seconds. I mean, if they knew I was a major alcoholic, they're not going to say, hey, you want just one little shot of tequila? I'm not going to offer you a whole bottle, just like, it's just a shot, it's just one brownie. Like, if, if people knew I was as struggling as much as I was, they would hold me accountable. But because you know, there's certain things in our culture, let me even say it this way, there's certain things in our culture that's acceptable, and there's certain things in our Christian friends that's acceptable. I want to say this, we, we were doing a lot of premarital counseling that when we had no idea what we were doing. Is that awesome? Some of you guys are, some of you guys are fruit of that? You're welcome. We started doing premarital counseling when we were pretty young, and uh, we tried different stuff. Bill Jens helped me tremendously. Bill and Kay, they, they finally pulled me in and took me through some training. And we're like, use this material. And the first couple people that we had to do it with, like, these big, 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 big booklets, they went through and had, like, they had to go home and fill out all the paperwork. And I saw the guys were always like, oh, my gosh, we're going through this. And the girls were like, yes, this is awesome. We're going to go through this material? And so we started refining it and getting better and better at it. And this is what we learned. This changed accountability for us in relationship. Because before we'd say, you guys shouldn't do these things. And then we said, we want you guys to go somewhere else for a week, not talk to each other, fast and pray, and come back and tell us what your guys' rules are. You guys, gotta, you guys come back and say, we're not going to hold hands, we're not going to do this, or we are. Or, like, you, gotta, you guys figure out on your own what you feel is good. We're going to come back, talk to both of you, and then hold you accountable in your rules. Because when people put stuff on us that we aren't okay with, we don't really feel like what we're doing is wrong. And we're the only ones holding ourselves accountable. So I say that in, in most of our lives... At work, you can handle yourself however you want. In this group, you can handle yourself however you want. But God is asking us to, to handle ourselves how he wants. God is calling us to a personal relationship to him. The Bible says what's okay for one person is not okay with another. We get that. But if I'm in a group of people and it's not okay for me, but it's okay for them, I have to be able to hold myself accountable in it. And I don't think we do well to that as Christians. I think we think if it's acceptable to hear, it's acceptable for me, and it's not. And that could be a lot of areas of our lives. And my question for us is, are we, are we listening to what's going on in here? And then with Saul, it says if we're being disobedient, that, that, if we know we're supposed to do, if we, I'm going to get some more water. I moved in uh, years ago, uh, obviously, I was living with my parents, I got married, we moved into our own place, and then through the years, uh, a couple times we lived with them because finances, before, when I quit my job and moved to Yuba City, we, we lived with them for about a year because I was making good money and we had to sell some stuff and get back on our feet, and there's been several times, and then there was one year that we both were, we were just like, hey, we like we're living with each other, we both had separate homes and thought, why don't we just get one big house? And find, try to find something with two master bedrooms and just, like, get a big place so we can just have a big, nice house and barbecue and everything else. So we thought, that sounds like a great idea. So we moved into this giant house that was beautiful and awesome. And this was the one time in my life I said, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm not going to have one box at the end of the week. I'm going to hang every picture frame. Like, we've moved a lot. So we did. We had everything. We went through everything, put everything away. The first week, we just pushed through. I went, to, uh, I went on a trip with, with Sold Out. My wife calls me and says, hey, there's like this tiny bit of mold under the sink. I don't know what's going on in the kitchen. I said, spray some stuff on it. And she sprayed it, cleaned it, called, bye, gone. Three days later, she calls and says, it's like growing. So she called. They came in. They opened the wall and said, uh, you need to move out of the house. You got to move out. Like, it's, it's bad. The upper bathroom has been leaking for years, apparently, and the whole inside of the walls of the house are mold. What's amazing is, I know that we know this, but there was numerous times we just kept cleaning this small spot and like it's going to go away, it's fine. And I know that it's that way in so many areas of our lives, guys. There's this little tiny thing that pops up and yet so often there's this deeper issue that we're either just trying to scrub the one spot or we're more concerned about, well, if, can I hide this? Is this hideable? 
If it's hideable, I'm good. The truth is nothing is hideable. And so often when we fall hard, we know that we had many of opportunities to either come clean in our sin or there was a light on saying something is not quite right. And it may be as simple as an alternator belt broke off and so it's $20 later and a little bit of work and that alternator is going to start charging the battery again and life's fine. It could be something that's so simple, yet if we're on it right away, there's nothing else that happens. We just get on it, we focus on it, and we say, I'm going to fix this, or we allow it to grow bigger. Proverbs 4.23. This is, this is the New King James and New Living Translation. Same, same verse. It says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. I think my next question is, are we willing to begin to ask God to check our hearts? I think there's twofold. There's times in our life where we need to be disciplined enough to where when we hear something, that we're on it. Like, man, how come I responded that way? I seriously, guys, I do it. And a lot of times, I've come to a place in my life where, where I, I don't blow up or scream or yell. I know that. But I, something comes up. That emotion starts coming up, and I'm like, man, that's weird. Why did I respond that way? I didn't respond that way here, but I felt myself responding that way in here, which to me is just as scary. This is, this is crazy. I was at, uh, we and my son, we went to this place. We parked his car. Uh, we didn't jump the fence and climb in. We jumped the fence and climbed in. So there was this old water park. <laughs> there was this old water park. It was really cool, and the skaters had been in there. Everybody had been painting and everything. So we just we came out, checked it out, jumped the fence, and we were out looking at it, right? And this is just here a couple years ago. And uh, we were looking at everything, checking it out. It was awesome. And then a car pulled up behind our car. It was kind of bushes. And we were there like, oh, what's going on? And we saw the trunk pop open, and they were pulling stuff out of the trunk. Well... I said, oh, man, we start running for the car, and I thought, this is, I thought I said, oh, and I said a bad word. That's what I thought I said. We're running for the car, and I, Bailey was right next to me, and we started running for the car. We found out it wasn't in their car. It was, it was their car, not our car. There are two white cars, so they're actually in their trunk. I think they were getting stuff to help them climb over the fence. So, <laughs> so we turned around. I said, Bay, did I, did I just cuss? He said, no, no, not at all. Why? I said, this is crazy because... I, I heard it, and it wrecked me. And that sounds crazy, but I had tried so hard for so long to just be careful what I was saying, watch it, watch it, that I thought I said it. And it was just what was going on in here. And the crazy thing is, guys, it, it doesn't matter what we do. If we will work on whatever we want to work on, we can become disciplined in it. That doesn't mean it's easy, but it's worth it. Right now, I, I, I want to become in a place where I physically am in the design God created me for. We're all created different, right? Some of us are bigger, smaller. Some of us, what is my created design that God, what, is, what size am I supposed to be if I'm just eating discipline and doing right? I don't actually know. I'm hoping I can find out and not worry about what everybody else says. Man, Paul, you're getting too skinny. Here's a sandwich, right? <laughs> Paul needs to eat a sandwich. <laughs> Somebody sit down and give that boy a sandwich. I'm going to get there probably. But she, I was laughing at me. She's like, you ain't getting there, Paul. She, in the past, she says, you never have to worry about anybody thinking you're on meth, Paul. Don't worry about it. <laughs> when I've said they're going to think I'm a meth addict, she's like, nope, that ain't happening. That ain't happening at all unless you're a beginner. <laughs> yeah, straight up. That's Cheryl. That's why I love Cheryl. There is something in all of our hearts that we need to work on. We know that. And some of us in this room need to work on stuff that is about to train wreck us. And, and, and are we going to be at a place when we are tested by a God who loves us, a God who created us, a God who has a perfect plan and wants His will is for us to be, are we going to wait till He does it and He lays over and He says, hey, I'm going to open some stuff up in your life because so, I love you? Or are we going to do it our own? And guys, I, I know for me right now, it's, it's, it is it's discipline and food. I'm trying. I, I desperately want that in my life. 
And I could say I'm there because I feel really good about it, but I know it's not just the demonic, it's my flesh. It's me having to fight against this thing that I have just allowed to do whatever it wants for years. I got to discipline my flesh, whether demonic is or isn't, or people, or how I have to do that. And we all in our lives right now, I know, can say, okay, God, what is it? And then there's this scripture here. It says, Psalms 26, 1 through 3. Declare me innocent, O Lord, for I have acted with integrity. I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Put me on trial, Lord, and cross-examine me. Test my motives and my heart, for I am always aware of your unfailing love, and I am lived according to your truth. Can we say that? He's saying, test the motives of my heart. Test them. Like, God, this is a human saying, test my heart. God, check it out. Psalms 139, 23 through 24 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you. Come on. Point it out, God, and lead me along the path of everlasting life. God looks and judges our heart. I know I'm speaking on becoming tuned with your heart because are we becoming tuned to the where our heart is? It is such a big deal to the Lord. The, the more I read Scripture, the more I realize it is really one of the foundational keys to our walk with Christ. If there's stuff coming out of our heart, we can't truly love people. I believe that. And I know that our goal is to love people. I, I, when we're all over the world, when you're sitting down with people, they're like, man, you've got to love people. It's about love, which it is 100% about love. But the only way we can truly love is by having what God says is a pure heart. That nothing comes up. There's no offense in me. There's not all this stuff that when somebody says something out of the blue that I respond. So we're coming to this place. And I feel this with everything in me, guys. I know God is calling us to allow him to purify our hearts before it comes at a time when we have a fall. Tonight is, uh, is Cheryl's birthday, and, and we're going to have some cake in the back <clears throat> afterwards, and, and I, I want to give us some time to kind of fellowship tonight. But I want to pray for us because I believe, um, I spoke here a couple weeks at men's prayer, <clears throat> and uh, I shared a little bit of this message. Some of the stuff was in my heart, and Dave afterwards said, I feel like this is a, a now word for the church. I feel like you need to share this to the church. I think God wants to do something with it. And I believe that too. I think right now in my own life, it's a now word for me. It's why I'm sharing it. But I think it's a now word in our hearts that God is even now starting to pinpoint some stuff in our life. Say, I, I want you to look at this before it becomes an issue. It already is an issue. Light's on. The light is on. So I want us to stand up. And I want to pray for us. Hmm. I want to say this. I know that sometimes... I'll back up. When I, when I came here, I, I had night tears going on. Demonic was hammering my life. I got married. My wife ended up uh, having hearing some of the wildness that was going on in the night, and it scared the bejeebers out of her. And she said, you need to go see Dave, like, <laughs> tomorrow. I don't know what the heck's going on. This is crazy. And so I said, okay. I didn't think you'd be able to hear it, but I'll do that. I came up here and spent the evening with Dave, and we went into his office. He just anointed me, got behind me, prayed for me. Nothing happened for me. It was not well crazy, but that, that stronghold was completely broke off my life that night, right? It, it changed. Now, I still had to change my habits, do some, yeah, it's awesome. Come on, give God, that is, it's awesome, yeah. Uh, that all tells you, that's what tells you where Dave's at, because he just stood behind me. It could have gone all crazy. <laughs> he was just like, that's all right, we'll figure it out. All by himself, the middle of the night, he's awesome. But he prayed for me, he broke that off my life. But I'll tell you what, guys, the reason that stuff at that point in my life was coming up and I dealt with it right then, if I hadn't, it it would have destroyed my life. I'd have let it happen because I was living alone and I had sin in my life and it was just acceptable. But when my wife came in, she's like, this is not only not acceptable, this is crazy. (laughs) And I feel that there's a lot of that. That was a major thing in my life. It was major. But we need to treat the little things as big of a deal, because those are the things, especially the ones that nobody knows about, no one sees, no one, no one hears the voice inside, no one, whatever. Guys, 
we need to put that at the forefront and begin to say, God, search my heart. I think this. I came and sat down with Dave, and he was talking about, you know, hey, no one's perfect, and, and I know that we all have sin in our, my li- our lives. And I thought, yeah, right, Dave, you have sin in your life. <laughs> I remember thinking that. Like, my life's a mess, whatever, you're perfect. And it's not true, but I, I had so far to go, I felt like, to become who God called me to be that I just was overwhelmed. And I want to say this to you guys. If you're overwhelmed in here tonight, if I start talking like, man, there's, I don't even know where to start. God knows where to start. I want to say this to you guys. Don't worry about it's this big. Just, just say, God, I submit it to you. I put it at the foot, and I, just help me work on it. Just don't, don't bag it. Don't ignore it. Don't try to cover it. Just say, I'm not going to cover it. I'm just, I'm just going to be open hand and say, God, I don't even know how to fix this. That has been repetitive in my life. God, I, I want this to change. I have no idea how to. I desperately want to fix it. I don't even know where to start. Help me. So if you're overwhelmed, just start there. Just be honest about it and say, God, I, I just begin there. And, and if you're at another place where it's, you know what it is and, and you know that it needs to be strategic, then let the Spirit of God make it strategic in your life. Don't ignore it. Don't, when it comes up, get it. So Holy Spirit, we desperately want a pure heart. God, we want that. We want to be at a place in our lives where we can be out of us that flows out is your goodness and your favor and your wisdom and all the good things you have for us. We don't want the opposite. So Holy Spirit, right now, I ask first that you will pinpoint some areas in some of our lives to say that's why the light's on. You need to work on it. You need to, and God, if there's some of us in the room that are overwhelmed, help us to, to be honest, to be just open our hands and say, God, I don't even know how, but, but I, I'm willing to try and I want your help. Holy Spirit, help us to be so tuned with our heart that when we hear something come up that we don't make one excuse. We just stop ourselves and say, God, that, that needs to fix. Help me fix this. Hmm. God, don't allow anyone in here who heard this message and, and, and just get a train wreck months from now because they weren't willing to put in the work. It's not too hard to be at the, at the place in our lives that God wants us to be. He will give us grace for breakthrough in it. So as this is a now word, I speak for grace right now for there to be breakthrough in it. I speak for grace right now where the Holy Spirit has been pointing that, that even though some of us don't know how to do it or don't know that, you'll give us grace right now for breakthrough in it and for breaking off the demonic stronghold and to begin to have discipline in that area of our lives in our flesh. So God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' mighty, mighty name. And everybody said... Hey, guys, as you're going through this week, listen to the Holy Spirit, listen to that stuff in your life, and allow yourself to begin to work on it. All of us. I'm there. We're all there. And then next week, I'm going to do a heart check, which should be something that everybody is going to not want to come to because I'm going to be checking some stuff. No, Cheryl, that's probably not the way you bring people back in. So, hey, we got kids. If you can go get your kids, and it's Cheryl's birthday. If you want to love on her, say hi. We're going to have cake in the, in the back and also some coffee and stuff. But grab your kiddos, come back. We got plenty for everybody. We love you guys. Thanks. See you tomorrow morning or next weekend.